Hello, everyone. My name's Marnie, and I'd like to welcome you to Frankston City Library's Frank Talk with Tanya Blanchard. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which Frankston City Libraries operates, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to the elders of any other communities who may be joining us today. Now, Tanya is the best-selling author of The Girl from Munich and Suitcase of Dreams. Her latest release, Letters from Berlin, is an unforgettable tale of love, courage, and betrayal inspired by a true story. Tanya, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Marnie, and hi to everyone down in Frankston, a beautiful part of the world. I hope you're all coping well down there with the lockdown. We're getting there. We are getting there. <laughs> And tell me, Tanya, what compelled you to write Letters for Berlin? Well, it's a really interesting story. Um, when I was uh, writing um, The Girl from Munich, um, I, was, I was very privileged to have a box of my grandmother's documents, photos and memorabilia that she'd left behind when she passed away. And it was looking through those documents and letters that I came across a single letter by a relative in, in Germany. Um, they'd actually sent her a copy of this letter um, and it was from her first cousin um, who the family had lost contact for some years. Um, and he wrote to say that he had remembered my grandmother's brothers um, going to the Eastern Front um, and lost contact with the family shortly after. But a company that was amazing to find out this other branch of the family that I never knew about but the most amazing thing was that there was a newspaper article that accompanied the letter and it actually outlined the story of this man's life and his family's life going through World War II in Germany and into the Soviet occupation. And the reason his um, story was in the newspaper was because he um, was in the middle of a landmark uh, legal case in Germany trying to reclaim property that his family had lost at the end of World War II. Um, and because it was such a big case, all the newspapers were reporting on this story over the 20 years that it took for the, the case to finalise. Um, so that was really amazing to read his incredible story. Um, so that's, that's what originally um, sparked interest in the story. And I thought, my God, this is a story I have to tell one day. So it's just sat on the back burner while I wrote Girl from Munich and then Suitcase of Dreams. And I went, right, this is a time for letters from Berlin. Oh, amazing. Just even having access to that kind of information is just incredible. Was, was there anything, I mean, obviously you're onto your third novel now um, around that, uh, that time in our lives, or not my life, but in history. Yep. Um, what, was that what drew you to historical fiction initially? Look, I've always been a big history buff. I always loved history. All I always loved writing too. But I grew up with family stories all around me. My German grandmother used to tell stories of her life in Germany during World War II when she was a young woman. And I was always fascinated and captivated by her stories. And then she told stories about what it was like when her and her family came to Australia in the 1950s and became New Australians. So, you know, I guess those family story, stories were always there and combined with my love of history, I couldn't help but fall into historical fiction and look it's it's definitely where I love to be. Absolutely now given the stories that your grandmother and your mother told you as a child how much of them do you think are in your novels? Oh um, quite a lot actually um, certainly with The um, Girl from Munich um, a lot of the, the stories that my grandmother told me are keystones within within the story um, I've tried to, and, and it's the same with Suitcase of Dreams and also Letters from Berlin, um, just going back to the, the letter and the, the um, newspaper articles that um, I found about, about my family story. Um, I find it really um, important to stick to um, historical accuracy, to um, provide um, some kind of authenticity um, around the stories of the time and also the people that lived through that era. With that in mind... What is your research process like when it comes to making sure that authenticity, I can't even talk today, is there and that, yeah. that, those, that those facts are factual? Yeah, yeah. I think it's really important. First of all, I start with the family stories. 
And then I look to um, historical um, detail behind those stories. So looking at the facts that they correlate with the story, making sure they match up with the time period, finding out what went around those major events in those stories and in my family members' lives. So looking at those historical events, uh, what their lives might have been like around that time. Um, and I think that in itself creates uh, quite a bit of authenticity. So there's a timeline definitely that I try and follow um, with the key points in the story matching historical events. And then I try and, I suppose, fill in the gaps in between. And I guess that's where some of the fiction then comes in, trying to imagine uh, what their lives might have been like, how they got from point A to point B, what they felt, um, what they did, how they got there. Um, and in that way, I try and develop a sense of authenticity. There's lots of research um, that goes into um, all of the events and even you, you'll only see small snippets often in the story, but I need to understand um, the background of the era, what was going on, the social situation, um, political situation, the economical situation. Um, so lots of documentary watching, lots of um, reading of historical um, or books from historians. Um, luckily, you know, I've been able to get some first-hand accounts as well, um, reading what people felt it was like at the time or what they went through. Um, so there's a lot of research that goes on um, before I even actually start um, putting the actual story together. Absolutely. Now, I have to say, with Letters for Berlin, I find with a, with a number of books, people say to me, oh, it's a bit slow at the beginning, but, you know, stick with it to Chapter 5 and you'll be all good. Can I say Letters for Berlin had me from Chapter 1? Yeah. It, <laughs> is, it is such a delightful story to read. Um, it... Obviously, it's dual timeline, so um, we're dealing with, sorry, I can't remember the characters' names at the beginning. My, my. Uh, Ingrid and Natalie. Ingrid yeah. and Natalie. So Ingrid being Natalie's mother yep. um, knows that she was adopted um, yep. at a young age um, and Natalie wasn't aware of that. And right. she has received letters from her, her mother, her biological mother, from Germany. Yep. Um, and it appears that she had been looking for her. And that's our, that's our opening scene. And then we go into those letters and that storytelling of Nazi Germany. What I love most about your book is where there are many books on World War II, many novels, um, biographies, all that, all that sort, of, sort of thing. Your book really does it from an angle of the normal pe person. For me, it's not, I, I don't, I haven't had to have a break from your book. It hasn't felt, I haven't quite finished it yet. I was saying to you off air, I've got about 100 pages to go and I'm absolutely loving it. Mm -hmm. um, it was an absolute delight until about halfway. And then <laughs> suddenly you put me on this roller coaster and I'd been going along going, this is a lovely book. It's so lovely. Oh, how wonderful. And then I went, Whoom, and I went, where did that come from? And you have said to me off air, there's more to come. <laughs> there is more to come. <laughs> So I, I do highly recommend Letters for Berlin. And I was saying to you also, it's a little bit embarrassing. When I do get a lot of authors through in media releases, I don't always know who they are. I'm not good with authors' names, but I'm good with covers of books. And I Googled you to start doing all the information that we need to get together in order, order to promote this event. And I looked at it and I said to my colleague, oh, my God, it's Tanya Blanchard. Like, <laughs> the Tanya Blanchard. It's it's Girl from Munich. It's Suitcase of Dreams. And they're looking at me going, huh? And yeah. I said, I have been looking at these books on the shelf in, in Kmart, wanting to purchase these books and going, I have so much on my reading pile already. Mentally, I'll catalogue these to purchase at a later date. And I'm like, I get to read one of her books now. <laughs> so, yeah, I was so excited. I have to say the cover and the covers of all your novels are absolutely beautiful, Tanya. Yeah. Was that... How did you go through the process of choosing that cover? Were you given a few? Do you know what? No, I wasn't. Uh, the people at Simon & Schuster knew what they were doing right from the start. I don't know whether we were um, linked, you know, um, through ESP or what it was, but they knew exactly the right cover to put together in the first place. Um, I, I, well, with Girl from Munich, I don't know if you guys can see that one here. So it's the blue, the green and the yellow um, and the girl sort of running away, I suppose. Um, 
they're, they're my favourite colours and they're, they're just, it's just such a dramatic yet romantic, just eye-catching cover. Um, and the moment I saw it, I went, oh, my God, this is better than I can have ever imagined. Um, look, so I, I didn't need to have any input into the cover because it was magnificent right from the start. And those colours are my favourite colours. And interestingly, when I was first um, looking at... Um, photographing the cover of the book. Um, there's a scarf my grandmother made for me, this same German grandmother, years and years ago. It's my favourite scarf. It's a silk scarf and it's got blue and green and yellow in it. So all of those same colours. So I'm thinking maybe she's looking down from above and directing the action here. Um, but whatever's happened, I'm, I'm really, I really love all three colours. They, they follow suit and the colours just pop and it tell, they tell a story already. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you that they're just dramatic. They're dramatic covers and they're the covers you want to pick up off the shelf. There's so many books that I've, I've read through this process of our Frank talk that I would never have picked up off the shelf and end up being an amazing read. But your books, they just, they grab you on the shelf before you've even started chapter one. It's amazing. They've done such a good job. That's great. Yeah, well, I'm so thankful to my wonderful team at Simon & Schuster. They've, they've done all of the hard work in that and, look, I couldn't be more grateful. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, Lisa has asked a question. She wants yep. to know how you went with your historical research written in another language and if you, if you speak fluent German or did you need assistance to interpret the documents and yep. did it present any challenges to your research? Yes, yes. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for your question. Um, no, I don't speak fluent German. In fact, I speak very little German at all, sadly. Uh, my mother is fluent in German. So when we first tackled my grandmother's box of treasures after she passed away, a lot of the letters and documents were in German, of course. She was able to help quite a bit with deciphering some of the information. Um, but she lives in northern New South Wales and I'm in Sydney. So that wasn't always um, practical. Um, so I turned to Google uh, Translate. <laughs> Thank God for Google Translate. Actually did quite a good job with being able to decipher the main meaning behind a lot of the documents. Um, it was quite easy if the documents were typed and a lot of them were at that time. Um, so that made the process relatively straightforward and I could work out the sense of what the document was about. Um, letters were a lot harder, of course. Um, some were typed, thank God, but a lot were not. A lot were just that beautiful, flowy, gorgeous script, which maybe I would have been able to decipher if they were in English. But being in German, I had no hope. So there are still quite a few letters there that I will have to sit down with my mother and maybe even a translator, um, because even she found it difficult to decipher mm. some of them and actually work out um, what they're all about and then, just, and then just have them translated into English. So, yeah, it did provide some difficulties, most definitely. Um, but, look, where there's a will, there's a way, and generally you, you find out what the gist of, of that document's about and um, you can move forward. Absolutely. Now, speaking of challenges, oh, Lisa's also asked, did you travel to Germany to do any research? Uh, Lisa, I didn't travel this time to Germany to do my research, but I have been before and um, I have seen where my family members lived. Um, so I was able to draw on that knowledge. Um, the other thing was that my grandmother had the most wonderful photographs. Um, so there was so much information at my fingertips that I was really fortunate that I didn't have to travel this time. Great. Now, what challenges have you encountered while writing your characters? So particular, particularly characters that are quite complex and multifaceted, like Susie and Julius. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, um, yeah, it has been a bit of a challenge. Um, I always had a fairly firm idea of what Susie was like as a character in my head. When you're initially writing characters, they, in your first draft, um, I guess for me, they can tend to be a little bit more um, wooden and two-dimensional. Um, and it's only... I, for me, when I finished the first draft, that I can go, right, now I have a good sense of what my characters are about, what they believe, um, how they'll react um, and how they will behave uh, with, with the storyline that's occurred, with the events that have occurred around them. 
So then I have a better sense to then go back in the second draft and fine tune those characters and fine tune the relationships as well. And look, this can go on for a process of two, three, four edits until, you know, you're doing that really beautiful fine tuning at the end. You go, yes, finally nailed that character. Yes, that was the missing piece of the puzzle. I've got it now. I love where this is sitting. Thank God I have amazing editors um, who are able to, you know, give me good perspective. Because when you're in the middle of the writing, you can't see the wood for the trees quite often. Mm. Um, and they'll just, you know, sometimes state the obvious, often state the obvious. Um, and you'll go, yeah, okay, why didn't I see that? But, you know, that offers some really great insights too. And so that, that's been a very valuable help to, um, to have them involved in that. I must say there's parts of those characters that I want to touch on now, but I'm so scared of giving away <laughs> plot lines because, because the first roller coaster is a twist in a character. So I'm just, they were just so intricate, each character. And, and those plot twists were so... I guess they're almost sneaky. Like they snuck up on me and I was like, where did you come from? It was just, it was very, very well written, Tanya. So congratulations. Thank you, thank you Mike. Now, Look, I guess the thing I want I just want to add, just I wanted to write about ordinary people, right? And so ordinary people are complex. Um, you know, no one is straight good or straight bad. Everyone has a bit of everything in them and it just depends on the situation and the circumstances as to how some mum will behave and react. And, you know, everybody has redeemable um, qualities and characteristics and I, that's what makes characters complex. That's what makes people complex. So that, that's, try, that's where I was coming from when I was trying to write these characters. Yep. Absolutely. Now, how long generally in your writing style does it take to get your first draft down on paper? Yeah, generally about a year. Um, sometimes that includes the research that I do at the beginning. That can take, you know, sort of a couple of months, two or three months. Um, I may well begin the writing process um, while still doing some of that research. Um, sometimes I find that the book travels down a path that I didn't know it was going to and I'll need to do additional research. Or sometimes I just find that I need to know more about a certain thing before I put it down on paper. So research is often ongoing anyway. Um, but, yeah, generally about 12 months um, from where to go. Yeah. And by the sounds of it, with historical fi fiction, there is a level of planning that has to be undertaken. Yeah. But generally speaking, would you say you're a planner or a panther? Are you? <laughs> how do you generally write your stories? Look, I'm somewhere in between, I think. Um, I like to have a general plan of where my story is going. I like to have a general scaffold of the major points in the story um, and, and obviously the historical timeline that goes with them. So that, that's really important for me to start um, and that gives me a more smooth flowing uh, writing process. Um, but having said that, I can sit down at my desk at the beginning of the day, uh, know where I need to end up, but not sure how I'm going to get to that point through the day. And so the writing then takes on a life of its own. Some days I end up totally different position um, and um, somewhere that I didn't expect to be. Um, and, and that's part of the creative flow that just comes through. And it's, and it's absolutely wonderful when that does happen, because that's often where the most interesting writing occurs. Um, so, yeah, I'm a little bit of both, I have to say. That's not a bad thing. I think that's pretty well balanced. Yeah. Pretty well balanced. Yeah. Now, I do have a question here. Um, raw Trouble User is the ID, but um, they're so glad that they came across you and found out about your books, which they haven't actually read yet, but they're really excited to read them. Um, Berlin is actually their hometown. Will your books be translated into, sorry, Inga, it's Inga. Will, will your books be translated into German one day? And she would love to be able to share them with her family members in Germany. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Inga. Uh, look, at this stage, they're not translated into German, but look, pushing for that to happen, hoping for one day for that to happen, most certainly. Yeah, would love, would love to see them in Germany. Yep. I must say, I was, trying to, I was trying to pinpoint exactly what it was that I liked about your book from the normal people point of view. Mm. And I think, um, talking about being able to speak German and things like that earlier, it was things like Susie being able to translate the BBC radio into German for the family when they were bunkering down and illegally listening to it, um, but also not quite knowing what's going on. So for me, in other books about World War II, it's about Auschwitz or it's about, you know, it's about the atrocities. Mm. 
But this was really about a normal person trying to live their lives and survive under in wartime um, while having a Jewish family member who was currently protected by the law. Um, but just the snippets coming in, I'm hearing rumours that Auschwitz is apparently a bit worse than the others and, you know, these people are being, you know, relocated um, and then their belongings are being sent back within days. Something's not quite right there. Um, it, was, it was just that... Um, I guess un having them unfold for themselves the difference between the propaganda they were being fed and what was actually happening. And I think you you actually balance this really fine line that quite often I find it really difficult to work, to read World War II stories um, because of those atrocities. And I, I do need a break and perhaps read another book in between while I'm reading those books. Yeah. But I, I'm just, honestly, I'm just loving your book. <laughs> like I, I, I really do. I, could, I actually couldn't recommend it more I think it's a really lovely honest human account of what it was like during that time for a particular area of the population um and then the changes in their own village towards them as yeah. propaganda changed um yeah. and how hu human beings on as a whole can be brainwashed and influenced by government the way that they are it's a bit scary when you think about what's going on now but um <laughs> But I think, I think you really, really got that line just right. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Well, well that, that was what I was aiming for. I really didn't want to overdo it. Um, I wanted to explore what, you know, how ordinary people would react in those kind of situations. Um, and you're going to get the whole gamut of reactions um, towards the Nazi propaganda. And, uh, and I wanted to explore sort of all angles of that as well. Um, and that's how these people would have really lived in these times. Mm. Um, so it was really important for me to be able to get all of those views across. Absolutely. Now, when you're writing Girl from Munich, what was your publishing story? How did you get in to be a published author? Well, that was a really amazing story, actually. Um, I start, I've always loved writing and I started writing again um, when I had my children. So I was home with them when they were really small. I'm an ex-physiotherapist, actually. Um, so I was home with them when they were really small and I started writing stories for them. And I remembered how much I loved writing and how much I wanted to write again. So I started writing stories for them and ended up doing um, some online writing courses um, just learning more about structure and characterization and dialogue and that sort of thing, just the bare bones of this, of this, of how to write. Um, and that enabled me to sort of um, progress my story I was writing at the time um, further. So I started with a children's novel, which morphed into young adult as my daughter grew older. Um, and I'd taken that pretty well as far as I could. Um, I had done a one day workshop while I was living in Canberra with Fiona McIntosh. Um, who's this great, wonderful historical writer. Um, and she's a very passionate and wonderful presenter as well and loved that day with her. Um, and I noticed that she had a five-day masterclass in Adelaide for uh, commercial fiction. I thought, right, this is the time for me to go and do something like this and see whether I can actually really write, whether I'm deluded um, or whether maybe, maybe, maybe I might be able to one day be published it was always the dream to one day maybe be published, write a novel and be published. So um, I went to the five-day masterclass. Um, Fiona had a little look at um, a sample of my work, of, of the, uh, the young adult fantasy that I'd written. She said, yep, yep, you can actually write, but fantasy stories really aren't sort of doing so well on the Australian market from Australian writers at the moment. Look, is there something else that you'd like to write? I said, well, actually... You know, hearing you talking about your historical writing in these five days, these are my grandmother's stories that she told me when I was a child. And she went, oh, my God, you definitely should write about them. I said, look, I've always wanted to, but never known, you know, whether it was the right time. So after that, I went off and um, I started writing The Girl from Munich. Um, at, at that five-day course, I also um, was able to pitch my story to a publisher, which was an absolutely wonderful opportunity. And then I did a follow-up uh, weekend on sort of um, branding and uh, publicity and, and um, the publishing industry um, about six months later. And um, uh, Simon & Schuster, the publishers, were there and uh, I pitched my story to Simon & Schuster and they loved the idea of the story and said, look, let us know when you finished it, um, which, which I did. 
Um, and they went, yep, we really love your story and we would like to pick up the girl from Munich. Um, I was absolutely blown away. Right place, right time, right story, I think. But um, it was incredible how that started and, and that, that started my process. I've got to tell you, I absolutely love hearing authors publishing stories because everyone's is different. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest takeaway from all of our frank talks um, for our writers who are watching is just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Um, you know, when it's the right time for your book, it will get published. Yeah, yeah. So I was writing probably, you know, probably about 10 years, I suppose, um, before this finally happened, yeah. 10 years seems to be the clincher. It's like everyone goes, oh, I wrote it for 10 years. Um, but I think if you can get to 10 years, you're an overnight success, you know. <laughs> Uh, I've had so many people say to me, oh, it took me 10 years to be an overnight success. Yes. <laughs> oh. yeah. Now, Helen has asked if your books um, will be made into talking books. Well, I can say, Helen, they are already. Yep. So we actually have um, Tanya's books available in ebook and e audio on the RB Digital app and the Borrow Box app, which are both available to you with your Frank City Libraries membership. If you're not a member, you can sign up on our website today for free. Um, everything's free. So why wouldn't you? But you sign up, immediate access. Um, now tell me, who's the first person that you allow to read your that first manuscript? Okay, look, the very first thing that I wrote was this uh, story for my daughter. Actually, it was my grandmother, my German grandmother, was the very first person who read that manuscript. And she was the one that said to me, keep writing. I think, you know, you're doing a terrific job. I think you've got some talent and I'd love to one day see it as a movie. So she was my initial um, inspiration. I was very close to her and, um, and she, you know, she saw that there was something in my writing. Um, and that's why it was absolutely amazing then when I went on to write The Girl from Munich, which was my first published novel, um, which was about her and her life. Um, yeah, so it came full circle. Wonderful. Now tell me, what are some of the surprising things that you've learned while writing your novels? Wow. Okay. Um, well, I guess, um, especially with uh, Letters from Berlin, um, I found it really interesting. Well, actually, all, all through um, Letters from Berlin and The Girl from Munich, it was about um, the lengths that the Nazis went to to control the population, I guess. The historical research I found really, really fascinating. Um, when I was um, writing Girl from Munich, um, I came across a document in my grandmother's box um, and it was basically um, a family tree um, of my, or my, my grandmother had one and my grandfather had one also. And it went back like three, four, five generations. I think hers were even six generations. And I thought, wow, what an absolute find. Um, but when I looked into what these documents were actually about, they were documents of proof of German blood. So there was a there was what they call a little pedigree certificate where you only went back a few generations to prove that you had German ancestry and no Jewish background. Um, and then there was the, the big pedigree where you went back maybe six generations. Um, and that was needed for people that held um, uh, land holdings. Um, it was needed for people to go to university, um, to join the civil service and, and you know, be, be a bureaucrat. Um, all manner of things in life, you needed these pedigree certificates. So as much as it was so exciting for me to learn about this family tree that I had and all these wonderful um, bits of information about family members, it was actually quite sinister, the reason mm -hmm. that they existed in the first place. Um, so, yeah, that was one of the really fascinating things I learned and, and that was a really big shock. And, and then, look, it followed on with other research through The Girl from Munich and Letters from Berlin. Um, with Letters from Berlin, I learned a lot about mixed marriages so you'll find in the story that um, the, the Heckers, it's a story about the Hecker family. Um, Elia Hecker is a Jewish woman um, with a, from, from Russia originally married to Georg, who is a German man. Um, he's landed gentry. He has a big property outside of Berlin. And, and to discover that um, the reason people in mixed marriages, the Jewish people in mixed marriages like this were protected by the law. Um, despite the race laws of 1935, um, which forbade uh, Jewish people to be involved in relationships or marriages with German people, um, but it, they weren't retroactive laws. So people that were married prior stayed married. 
Um, and these were the people often that survived the Holocaust and survived the war inside these mixed marriages. Mm. So to learn a little bit more about what, what this was about, what the classifications for the various mixed marriages were, um, and then um, how through the war, as the war progressed, how their lives became more increasingly in danger, um, I found absolutely appalling and fascinating. It was not a group of people I'd really um, known terribly much about before. Um, and that's why it was such an exciting story to write. Absolutely. And I can absolutely see where that research has come into Letters for Berlin and just the in intricacies of people marrying people to protect people. And it was just, yeah, and that lineage going back, which meant if two of those people married, then people down below who weren't as protected are now more protected because they're associated with that person. It was just, it took a while for me to get my head around that yeah. side of it. Yeah. But it, it is, it's shocking to know that that needed to be thought of. Mm, yeah. It, it was a lot to take in. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, um, it, it's quite appalling to think um, how these sort of things ever, ever eventuated. Um, I, I remember reading some um, accounts of uh, Jewish people that were protected actually by the Nazi leadership um, because they were important to the government in some way or form and how their protection changed over time, say from before the war, the beginning of the war, and then towards the end of the war, they, they were in serious danger of not surviving at all. Um, but just to see how that changed with uh, the different um, people coming into the Nazi leadership, uh, how fanatical they were about um, uh, getting rid of the Jewish people and the final solution, as they called it. Um, and then there were other people that were more willing to look the other way. So it was mm. really quite fascinating to research about that too. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm waiting tonight to find out what's happening to Leo. So um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking Good. forward to that, to see what Leo's doing. Um, that's not giving anything away. Um, <laughs> now tell me, what has been a career highlight for you? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, um, with the girl from Munich, um, I was absolutely gobsmacked to learn that it was uh, shortlisted for the ABS um, for um, new emerging writer um in uh, 2018 um so that that was pretty amazing being my first published novel and also the story of my grandmother um which was really close to my heart so that was a very big career highlight um and i guess the other really big um highlight was uh, earlier this year when um the girl from munich and suitcase of dreams combined reached sales over a hundred thousand um so my publisher was pretty happy about that so that was that was a very exciting moment as well to think that I'd ever got to this position I mean who knew um I was just writing because I loved them and because I wanted to get those stories out there and to find that other people are loving them as much as I loved writing them um is really really special to me so I really wanted to share these stories with other people and share a different perspective on war um so yeah that was really meaningful to me Absolutely. Now, Inga has asked if it's possible to order a signed copy of your book. So I might hook her up with you afterwards. Yep, no worries. Beautiful. Now, tell us, what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> do you have spare time? Does that exist? Uh, not a lot of spare time. Look, I'm a mother of three children. Um, so I'm pretty busy with, um, with uh, looking after kids when I'm not writing. Uh, but look, I love, I love to cook. Um, when I get some spare time, I love to relax in the kitchen and just cook something lovely. Um, coming from a mixed heritage, my mother's German, my father's Italian, you know, big foodie cultures, especially in regards to celebrations. So love doing the big cooking thing before big events like birthdays and Christmas and that sort of thing. Um, so that, that's a really big one. Um, I love, um, I, love to, I love to read when I can. I don't get a lot of time to do that now. But between Christmas and New Year is, is a time where I just say, no, nah, not doing anything, and I'm sitting with a really, really good book. Absolutely. Now, Dawn, you have taken my next question. <laughs> so Dawn's asked who your favourite authors are, and I was going to ask what's on your reading pile and who you would recommend. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
hard questions because um, there are lots of different authors that I love. Um, I guess uh, someone that I, I've, I've really enjoyed reading, um, and you probably all know who this is, Diana Gabaldon um, of the Outlander fame. You may have seen the wonderful lavish miniseries on, um, on television. Um, so I love her writing style. I love the way she really delves into the historical fiction or the historical events and finds that really fine detail of everyday life that's authentic to the times. I love the way she writes her scenes. They're so, so beautifully um, detailed with um, sights, sounds, touch, taste, still the five senses. Um, so she's one of my favourites. Um, I love Ken Foley, again, big historical epics, Pillars of the Earth, um, so again, he's, he does lots of great historical detail through his fictional stories too. Um, look, I also love reading fantasy. Um, that's my real go-to if I really, really want to unwind and forget anything else around me. Um, so what's on my reading pile? At the moment, I'm reading um, a codename Helene. I think that's what it's called. Uh, it's about Nancy Wake. It's a book oh. that's recently just come out. I right can't, now. can't think of the author's name right now. Terrible. Um, but look, it's Nancy Wake is the famous resistance fighter, Aussie girl, um, and this just offers another view of the different facets of her life as she fought the resistance in France during World War II. So I'm really loving reading that. Mm. I was going to um, say, I'd be keen to read that because I've got Peter Fitzsimmons' um, book on her. Okay. Um, Okay. Well, I, I two might very different approaches i would say different yeah oh yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 but, but look really really love it um oh kate furnival i love her um she's another great historical writer um and something interesting i read oh my goodness now you're going to get me what um okay i think the, the book is called the convert um and i think stephen hartman uh, so it's translated into English. He's, I think, a Dutch writer. Um, and it tells the story of a Christian girl in the 12th century um, who converts to Judaism because she marries a Jewish man. And she's chased through um, France and Spain and into the Middle East um, by her uh, Norman uh, father's, he's an aristocrat, his Norman, fa Norman father's um, soldiers. Um, and it just follows her amazing story. It's told part fiction, part research. And this guy actually lived in, in the village where she had lived with her Jewish husband, hiding from her Norman father. Um, so it's really fascinating blend of styles and um, absolutely loved it. It was really, really different, really interesting. So there you go. Ooh. Now tell me, when you are writing... Do you have any unusual habits or rituals? And, and, and do you have a set number of words you need to achieve every day or, you know, set up your space a certain way? How do you go about it? Yeah, look, I'm pretty boring, really. <laughs> I um, Look, I, I get the kids to school and then I sit down at my desk with a hot cup of coffee, my woolly dressing gown when it's cold and my Ugg boots um, and just get into it. Um, I write usually all day until they come home from school, um, take a short break in the middle, but I do try and keep to a word limit because I find that's the only way that the manuscript will get done um, and that then I can reach that deadline. So as a general rule, I write somewhere, depending on when the deadline is, between five and 8,000 words a week. Okay. Um, and I will then split that up if I'm writing four or five days. It just depends on, on the week and what I've got on. Um, yep, yeah, and um, yes, yeah, so, and then I just keep writing through until I have finished that first draft. I would love nothing more than to go back and re-edit and edit and edit and edit certain sections, but then you never get to the end and you never see the big picture. So I've had to learn to just keep moving forward um, and then with the second draft, then you start to do more of that fine-tuning. Yeah. Absolutely. So. I just, I get so jealous. I'm like, can I just have a full-time job of writing? <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely look, amazing. my dream job uh, as a oh. kid, like, you know, I never imagined I'd be doing this. So I just feel so incredibly fortunate. 
Oh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Now, Lisa has just asked what your future plans in writing are. Would you stay in historical fiction or are you looking at something else? And I would like to know whether you're going to revisit your fantasy manuscript. Hmm. Okay. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to stick with historical fiction and family stories. Um, I've got lots of family stories in, in the back of my mind ticking away there um, that could be that I could draw on for, for future novels. Um, at the moment, I'm writing um, a novel based on my father's heritage. So he's from Italy um, and I'm writing a story set in southern Italy um, leading up to and during World War II. Uh, fascinating place, um, very, very ancient, lots of really fascinating, really old traditions. Um, the countryside is very rugged with mountains all the way to the ocean. Um, so I found the research for this really, really fascinating um, and I didn't know the story of Italy during the war um, and it's quite different to a lot of the rest of Europe um, because, of course, they sided with Germany and then the Allies um, invaded Sicily mm. in 1943 and um, that led to Italy becoming or basically going into civil war, the north against the south. So that was really interesting to learn about and to, to place my characters in that environment. So I found that really very, very interesting um, so I will stick with historical fiction um, and I've got lots of stories. And as far as that fantasy novel, maybe one day. <laughs> maybe. One day. <laughs> it's sitting in the bottom drawer somewhere. Um, probably It'll have its time. Probably. It will have its time. But maybe, maybe when the grandkids come along one day. Maybe. Who knows? We'll see. Now tell me, what is your advice to any aspiring authors who might be watching this today? Look, what I would say to you is write. If that's what you love and that's what you're passionate about, write. Write what you love. Write what you're passionate about, not what you think other people would like to know about or, or want. You've got to write what from the heart, I think. Um, look, as, as I was saying earlier, um, just write forward. Don't edit back all the time. Try and get the first um, draft done. And if... If, like me, uh, you find a word count helpful, um, that will get you to the end of that manuscript. Um, so that's kind of practicality. I find that really useful. Um, yeah, they're, they're probably the main things. Wonderful. Now, what do you hope readers take away from Letters for Berlin, from Berlin? Well, I guess the main thing um, I wanted to get across is, is the perspective of war um, from a really different group of people that I didn't know about and I'm assuming a lot of other people didn't know about and that was those Jewish people in mixed marriages and their mm. children who were half Jewish. The laws were quite different regarding them as well. So I just wanted to um, have that insight into what their lives were like during the war and, and how, how their sense of endurance and their, their strength and their, their perseverance um, enabled a lot of them to survive till the end of the war years. It's heart-wrenching stories that this group of people went through as well. Um, and look, it's, it's a story about family and legacy. So I guess that will relate to a lot of people, reconnecting with family members, learning new family stories, just like I did. The, the letter at the beginning with uh, Ingrid and um, Natalie really... Um, is the same as my story. Um, it mirrors my story when I discovered my grandmother's letter and discovered this other branch of my family. So I, I guess um, I guess that's the other thing that I wanted to get across, just that sense of family and legacy and how these stories really um, should be told. Um, we should try and learn what our family stories are and share them with everybody else um, so that they're never forgotten and that these wonderful people who lived during this, this era, this difficult era um, won't ever be forgotten either. Well you've certainly done a wonderful job in all three of your novels Tanya. Now where can people find you online? Um, yes um, I do have a Facebook author page it's Tanya Blanchard author um, and I also have a web um, website um, and it's the same thing Tanya Blanchard and um, yep and you'll find me there as well. Beautiful well thank you so much for joining us today Tanya it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. It's been lovely speaking with you too, Marnie, and thank you to everyone in Frankston for joining me today and for your lovely questions too. I uh, hope you all stay safe and stay well. Thank you so much. Now, Daniel's novels are available to borrow on our RB Digital and Borrow Box apps. 
in both ebook and e audio, which you can access for free with your Frankston City Libraries membership via our website. If you're not a member, you can sign up straight away on the website. You can also pop her novels on reserve for click and collect at your closest Frankston City Library. If you need help accessing the online library, you're welcome to call the library team and they are happy to help. You can also purchase Letters from Berlin and Tanya's first two novels from Robertson's Bookshop in Frankston. And we have provided the link, but I will also provide it when we share this across our socials next week. Keep an eye on the Frankston City Library's website for the great Frank talks we have coming up, including Heather Morris speaking of World War II stories and General Sir Peter Cosgrove is also joining us in November. Yeah. They're both booking quickly, so please jump in and secure your place today. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Frank Talk with Tanya Blanchard for Frankston City Library. Mm -hmm.